Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming and welcome to, uh, to the session, Building Natural Capital, How Red Plus Can Support a Green Economy. Um, on behalf of our co-hosts, Jeanette and, and the UN Red Program, I'd like to welcome you to this discussion forum. My name is Tracy Johns. I work with Wildlife Works. We are a private Red Plus project and program developer working around the world to implement RED and to take our projects to scale. My focus is on the development of subnational RED programs, and we work to nest our individual projects within emerging programs of RED countries, including in the DRC, where I've been focusing, which along with Nepal from this part of the world, was just admitted into the pipeline of the Carbon Fund of the World Bank's Forest Carbon Partnership Facility. Which means, if we do our job right with DRC, uh, the DRC's program will be able to take advantage of carbon finance to support its, uh, its national green economy transition and forest protection program. This is great news for the DRC and for the other countries who are admitted into the carbon fund, but it is partly because these kinds of carbon finance opportunities are so limited in comparison with what is needed that we are here today to explore the connections between Red Plus and the broader green economy. The title of this session comes from a report developed with the support of UNEP and the International Resource Panel, in which I participated as a reviewer. I'll be using the results of this report as a frame for our discussion today, and I encourage you to pick up a copy uh, here in the back, or uh, to download a copy from the UNEP website. As those of us in this room know all too well, based on our, uh, the links of our work with land use and forests, the symptoms of climate change are having an increasing impact on issues such as the cost of food and energy and the outlook of availability of other natural resources. Increasingly outside of meetings like this, these challenges are being recognized as connected. In essence, that is what we are here today to discuss, quite simply, but also quite seriously. How can we improve human well-being while addressing increased demand for natural resources? within a low carbon or climate constrained context. Today, you and our distinguished panelists are here to discuss how RED can contribute to and provide a foundation for a green economy based on these principles. The opportunity and challenge for RED within this frame is to demonstrate the value of natural capital in the global economy. A tall order, certainly, but one that we hope our panelists today can shed some light on. I'd like to highlight a couple of key conclusions from this report and use these conclusions to set the stage for our panelists' uh, comments and for our follow-up discussion. But first, let me introduce uh, our distinguished panelists today. First, we have Pa Peru Casetio, who is the Deputy Chairman of the Presidential Unit for Development, Monitoring, and Oversight. Per Casetio holds the post of Deputy Head of Planning and International Relations in Indonesia's President Delivery Unit for Development, Monitoring, and Oversight. He was also a member of, of Indonesia's Red Plus Task Force. Prior to this, he was the Director for International Relations of the Executing Agency for Reconstruction and Rehabilitation, Aceh Nias. Haru has extensive private sector experience as well, having been a consultant for more than 15 years, and served as Country Managing Director for Indonesia at Accenture in 2002. On the other end, we have Mark Burroughs, Vice Chairman and Managing Director for Credit Suisse Global Investment Banking. Mark has had a 40-year career in investment banking, and as an Australian Treasury nominee, he has attended all of the B20, G20 summits since 2010 as a member of the Finance Task Force. He has been the principal advisor in some of the most significant and groundbreaking transactions in media and banking, and has also advised on sovereign default. Mark is a dendrologist, an environmentalist, and an adjunct professor of finance at Sydney University. Back to the left again, here we have Eka Ginti, who is the founder, commissioner, and former president and director of PT Rembaraya Conservation. The Rembaraya Biodiversity Reserve has over 64,000 hectares of carbon-rich tropical peat forest with extensive biodiversity and a, special, and a special commitment to the protection of the endangered Bornean orangutan. Eka is also experienced in business strategy and management functions, in technology, tourism, financial and climate change industries. He has worked in strategic management consulting, commercial and investment banks, and the world's largest software company. 
Then we have Sheila Whitley, Research Fellow for Climate and Environment at the Overseas Development Institute, OVI. Sheila's research is focused on private climate finance and private sector models for development. Prior to joining ODI, she worked in the carbon markets on clean energy finance and climate policy development within the public and private sectors. She has worked on the origination, execution, and financing of a range of low carbon projects in regions including Asia, Africa, North and South America. And then finally, here in the middle, we have Pavan Sukta, who is the CEO of GIST Advisory, which provides sustainability consulting services to governments, corporations, financial institutions, and civil service organizations. Pavan is a recipient of the 2011 McCluskey Fellowship of Yale University, as well as the 2013 Gothenburg Award for Sustainable Development. He was previously special advisor and head of UNEP's Green Economy Initiative, lead author of their Green Economy Report, and also a study leader for the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity Report. A career banker, Pavan took a sabbatical from Deutsche Bank to lead these two environmental projects for UNEP. While at Deutsche Bank, Pavan has founded and then chaired the Global Markets Center in Mumbai, a leading edge front office offshore company. Pavan has also chaired the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Biodiversity and was a speaker at Davos in 2010 and 2011. So I'd like to upfront thank our, our distinguished panelists for their participation in today's event. The Building Natural Capital Report covers several key findings and recommendations. And I, uh, as I mentioned, I encourage you to take a look at that either through the website or picking up a copy in the back. I've selected five of these findings and recommendations that I think will serve as a good framework for our panelists' remarks, as well as for your questions following their remarks. The first of these uh, findings is that an enabling environment should be created through greater coordination between governments, international agencies, and the private sector. One way of building a stronger economic case for Red Plus is to highlight its potential links to numerous other sectors. But in practice, as many of you have shown know, this has been difficult to achieve. Making demand and supply-side interventions mutually reinforcing will enhance the possibilities to affect the drivers of deforestation. Pat Heru, who has extensive experience in both government and private sector, perhaps you can elaborate a bit on how this enabling environment can be created to achieve these long-term goals. The second point from the report that I'd like to highlight is that fiscal incentive frameworks that encourage harmful practices, such as fossil fuel and certain agricultural subsidies, should be harmonized with red plus and green economy objectives. There's actually a fold-out in the report uh, which graphically demonstrates the importance of this point. In addition, policy instruments that promote green innovation and investments in support of red plus and a green economy should comprise a mix of measures which can include institutional reforms, regulations, including safeguards, risk mitigation tools, and pricing policies that get the incentives right. Sheila's work on incentives related to red plus and green economy is uh, highly relevant for this point. And Sheila, perhaps you can touch on this in your comments as well, how we can, how we can uh, get these uh, incentives right. The third point from the report is that red plus needs to give greater attention to non-carbon benefits in order to make a stronger case for forest conservation policymakers who are outside of the narrow red plus policy making realm. It also needs to devise new ways for financing and protection of these non-carbon benefits. The cost or the loss, the cost of the loss or decline of forest-based ecosystem services as a result of deforestation are estimated in the tens of billions of dollars annually. Tens of billions annually. But these costs do not currently show up in balance sheets in a way that incentivizes change and enforces driving this destruction. Pavan, your, uh, your uh, work in speaking and writing about the, the concept of the invisibility of nature, and uh, this I think is highly relevant for this point, and we hope that you can address this point in your remarks regarding how we can incorporate non carbon benefits into a stronger case for forest conservation. The fourth point from the report is that donor countries must fulfill their role in financing red plus as part of a mix of possible funding options. Creating the right enabling conditions and rules of engagement for large-scale private sector investment on the basis of strong safeguards is part of this responsibility. Donor investments in red plus should support private sector investment 
by addressing market failures and risks. And Mark, with your experience of large-scale private sector investments, perhaps you can give us your thoughts during your, uh, your opening uh, presentation on what tools can be most useful to unlock this large-scale private investment. The final point I'd like to raise from the report is that Red Plus must build support among a wider variety of stakeholders by ensuring equitable sharing of its benefits, thus increasing the sustainability and impact of the initiative. This includes local communities and forest-dwelling people who are key for our successful and long-term implementation on the ground. And Eka, based on your work on the ground in conservation, perhaps you can highlight for us in your thoughts uh, on this point of how to ensure equitable benefit sharing and how to use benefit sharing as a means for ensuring sustainability. Now we can't help, we can't hope to iron out all of the issues in these uh, expansive topics in Red Plus and the Green Economy in a 90 minute session, but we do hope to hear a, diver, a diverse range of perspectives on what can be done going forward. So now I'd like to move to five minute opening remarks from each of the panelists. Following that, I have a couple of media questions for the panelists. And then after those questions have been answered, we'll move to questions from you. So I'd like to start uh, opening remarks with Paul Heru, followed by Mark, then Eka, Sheila, and then Kavan. Because in December, the president assigned me the responsibility to be the head of the Redmas Agency here in Asia. Uh, after being uh, part of the task force that is assigning what we need to decide here. I, I will have to make a confession. When I get into this game of Red Plus, my knowledge about the forest, my knowledge about Red Plus, my team is close to zero. And because of that, I will be jumping into this game and uh, free writing in terms of uh, not having any established reference to work on. So when you're talking about reduction of emissions here, and suddenly after studying, talking to the people on the ground, talking to the masyarakat uh, adat, the customary people, the NGOs, the experts, the academics, and others, I, I realized that actually Red Plus and Green Economy are actually the same thing, at least from my perspective in the sense that you can only do red plus if you embrace green economy. If you say that the green economy is basically talking about, as we look into what is being defined here, let me read it The results can improve human well-being and social equity while significantly reducing environmental risk and ecological scarcity. To me, that is red plus. The reason why I say that is that because Red Plus, when it was introduced, was very much influenced by the discussion in climate change. Climate change is a global problem that needs global solution. And I have to implement Red Plus in a national context. So when I try to context that to a national situation, the President's promise of 36% reduction of emission is talking about the national development. But if the whole world is equally concerned about climate change, then they will contribute for this reduction, which is actually our contribution to the reduction of emission around the world. Now, having said that, then we look into the issue, how can we do the national development at the same time reducing emission? And that might fall back into the big economy theory. So, I will not say that Red Plus, what is Red Plus contribution for achieving the green economy? What will be the Red Plus steps moving forward into the green economy? Green economy is the prerequisite mindset to do Red Plus properly. And so when people talk about Red Plus, I'm doing this investment, I'm covering this forest, 100,000 hectares, and uh, no cutting on the trees, and then I get payment without thinking how to make this equitable for the people on the ground, without thinking that how can we do this sustainability, sustainably without conflict on the ground, then I think that is not Red Plus. To me, Red Plus is sustainable development with equity, as the President said this morning, but more than that, it, used, it, has, to, it has to 
make use of the concept of green economy to the heart. Now, what does it mean? It means that Red Plus and Green Economy face the biggest challenge. And the biggest challenge is a simple business as usual. So if you're all thinking about business as usual, what's the business case for that in the way that we calculate or we account for business the way that we account before, then that is the biggest challenge. It's a mindset issue. So you ask about what kind of enabling condition that needs to happen in any country. Number one, you need to improve the institution's capacity and mindset in terms of their sickness. You need to revise the regulations that was designed for the brown economy. You cannot apply that for a green economy kind of a concept. So you have to change that. You need to change the paradigm, not only of the government, but also the private sector. Just we want a green bonds. Nothing terribly complicated about that. Uh, bonds have been around for, for 700 years. Um, but bonds, green bonds themselves, are a relatively new product. Interest in them has been growing rapidly. They're being issued in an increasing number um, by a whole series of players, governments, development banks, the European Development Bank, and more recently corporates, um, most recently Unilever with a 250 billion pound bond issue, which I'll talk about later on. And interest has also moved from the retail sector to some of the world's largest investors, including the, 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 the future funds of a number of well-known countries. Now, the finance sector from which I come from, they take the green bonds very seriously, so underwriting them, subscribing to them, getting their private clients to invest in them. Uh, Credit Suisse, whom I work for, has signed the green bond principle. It was set out about a year ago by 12 banks, it's now been signed up, there are 24 banks party to that. Um, but it's a sign that this space is developing. Now, why, why are they useful? What are the attractive attributes of green bonds? Um, well, bonds are the largest pool of capital in the world. Um, and given the strains and relations of public finance, it's clear that we need to tap into these bonds if we're going to get the sort of money that's needed for, for sustainable development. Now, what we need in a green bond is a mechanism that the institutions that invest both understand are comfortable with and make sort of sense. Um, green bonds are a useful tool to preference green investments and also green based strategies over business as usual in business so that you actually get a priority because of what you do. Um, now this will require standards. So there's acceptability of and, 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 and basically understanding what it is that, 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 that is you're investing in. Um, understanding it's green and having independent verifications <coughs> of these standards. Now, it's really important to understand there's a difference between a set of standards and someone indicating yes or no whether that is a green investment. We're not seeking to choose winners or losers here. We're seeking to create standards to which people can comply and therefore that will attract the investment. Now that makes life easy for the investors. They reduce the risk and complexity of green, of green investing. They make product selection simple and standardised for investors. And they outsource the social and environmental due diligence to credible third parties. Rather like the much, much dispersed rating agencies uh, in the United States, but in a different world. Um, that is both in terms of policy and financial circles towards financing productive investments, which will provide long term economic stimulus. Now, when you develop the green bonds, you, you're also uncovering a large scale investor appetite that is in the marketplace. Now, the next thing I'd like to say is these green bonds are actually quite tiny by the scale of, of, of world investments. Um, last year, you're talking about $10 billion, which is a mere number. Um, um, we need to scale up green bonds. And to create the green economy, we need a blueprint. And for this, for this we need carefully planned green growth strategies that have forest-friendly growth at their core. We also need to think big. Investors repeatedly say that they want bond issue size of at least a half a billion dollars or more. 
Doing this allows them to invest with their existing mandates that require liquidity and credit worthiness and opens up a vast pool of capital. If you look at Greenmont, it's rather like an emerging industry. To start with, they were for specific projects. They had no liquidity. The project itself had to be sort of forthcoming and applied to certain people. When you get into green bonds, the sorts of things I'm talking about, they are holistic. They are much like government guaranteed bonds, but not government, obviously government guaranteed. But, but with the sort of intermediate I'm talking about, um, where there are credible standards to differentiate what is a green and what is not, and especially in, in complicated areas such as forestry and agriculture, these standards need to be verified by credible external third parties to make sure the fundraise for the bonds are helping and not hindering the development. And also we need to use public funds strategically to, 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 buy, to lower the cost of, of, of capital and to think about using tax incentives um, such as being incredibly uh, successful in terms of scaling up the oil and gas industry over the past three or four decades. And I'd like to stop there, but I just want to say one thing that, that I think is really important in terms of my own personal narrative. And that was that some two decades ago I was mandated by the Australian government, uh, Prime Minister Keating, to help write uh, the framework for the Australian superannuation super industry, which is a compulsory superannuation industry. That is now $1.6 trillion. 20 years ago, as much younger investment banker, we thought of actually mandating the spread of investments. And we thought of actually saying that 20% should be in bonds, 20% should be in cash, 60% in equities. We decided not to do that. Australia has probably the least developed bond market in the world in terms of its economic and financial position. There's a review coming as we speak of the Australian financial system. And when you look at the Australian financial system, this is going to be a pool of money um, in five years, which will be about $3 trillion. It will be three times the capitalization of the Australian stock market. That money is going to be looking for a home. And when I said earlier that, that green bonds both are a tool for sustainable development, but also a tool for getting your message across to the financial world as to what you are doing that does make money, that is sustainable, that does actually help the planet. Um, there are great pools of money that are looking, uh, particularly in the Asian area, for a home. And I just recommend that the, 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 the banking system can work with you they can develop products that, that, that can be given uh, the seal of good housekeeping, if I put it that way, but not in a way to differentiate or actually dictate what product you invest in to, 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 to be a facilitator for the growth you're talking about. But there is a great future here. There are large pools of money. It's a matter of accessing that. But in accessing that, you also need to tell the story correctly. Thank you. For us, 
local community relationship is beyond that. Local community relationship is, we view them as critical to the production of the company itself. It's a factor of production, much like our capital as well as our know-how. Why is that? Now, let's look at the, the, the operational of a, a company like, like, uh, like Rimba Rice. Uh, for us to be able to generate our product, in this case, carbon credit, we need to be able to show, we need to be able to maintain that we indeed prevent uh, deforestation from occurring. We indeed prevent uh, destruction of forests. Let's take one example, is, is illegal logging or forest fires. So we need to be proactively in preventing illegal logging from happening. We need to be proactively uh, uh, doing the work to prevent forest fires from happening. And the best way to do that is actually to engage directly the, the uh, communities uh, in within our area or surrounding the area of our, our carbon conservation. Now in the case of Rimbaraya, for example, there are seven villages around that, around uh, our conservation areas. And we do need to pay close attention to the importance of the forest for their livelihood. So if by conserving it, they can no longer do something that is, that is that what used to be uh, providing for their livelihood, then of course it's not going to work. So we need to find ways, we need to work with them to ensure that whatever we're doing is actually aligned, or if not, we're providing alternative livelihoods for them so that the pressure to prevent, to create forces that will prevent from production from the generation of carbon credits uh, not take place. Now, there are two, we work quite a lot with, uh, with uh, uh, community leaders as well as with the, with the NGOs that have been working there. I like to, uh, one, one NGO one, uh, that we have been working with closely from the beginning is the Orangutan Foundation International. Uh, OFI, led by Dr. Birute Gaulika, has been working in the area for the past, uh, probably around 40 years or so. So they've uh, involved the local communities. They hire hundreds of people from the local communities to help take care of orangutans in their care centers. And the local communities are also the ones who help in releasing, in training the orangutans to be repatriated into the wild. So it's a very deep relationship already with the local communities. It's not like we are helicoptering in, you know, a few guys from Jakarta or a few guys from California, you know, drop in and then you don't see them for three months and get out that sort of exercise. That will not produce the right result. That's one. There's another another NGO that was working in, in West Kalimantan that is really doing a great job. His name is Health in Harmony. They've got, it's led by a couple of doctors. I think one is a graduate of Yale. She's been spending, she and her husband have spent quite a lot of time in, in the forest. One of the things that, that impressed me uh, that they have done is, is coming up with this model about how illegal, log, illegal logging is basically an economic activity that can be substituted with health care. So they've come up with you know, a figure of how much do, uh, these local villagers would actually generate from illegally logging and what would be their demand for health care and sort of offset the needs by encouraging the local villagers to not do illegal logging in exchange for free health care. And that works in the, in the, in the, uh, in the areas that, that, uh, that they have been working on in West Kalimantan. And that may be something also that, that may be working uh, in, in the area that, that we are working on. So those two are examples. And I think the key, the key thing here is that the notion that, that uh, the local community before in any resources industry are treated as a CSR, post-production profit sharing, here is not so. They are part of, you know, if we're talking about equity, this is even beyond equity. This is the same, if we treat them as the same level as you know, ourselves, there as the shareholders, as the equity, as the capital that we're putting in, as the know-how that we're putting in. Now, Having said that, and having done one, the key, the challenge for us now is can we replicate this? 64,000 hectares is very small, micro. I was very comfortable, I felt very comfortable when I heard uh, Aheru as the chair of the uh, RGT Sandras in Indonesia talking about the big picture, about the macro level. Yes, that is exactly where things should be going. Now, the implication for small players like me is how can I help nibbling 
you know, one part of the solution, creating one part of the solution, and scaling it up. Right? If people can make billions by creating Twitter and Facebook, why can't you make billions by conserving forests? So I think I think that's the you know, in the rental case part. I was intrigued by the trillions of dollars that are available in the bond market, but probably that's not accessible for companies that are sold out. Because if I look at the return profile that we see in, in companies uh, that, that are doing this forest conservation for carbon credit model, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. The biggest one, one that banks always demand from us and when I'm going shopping around and trying to pitch this next idea, it's not even a fresh idea. You know, we got our funding for the fresh idea from, from some, some uh, uh, you know, wild institution, if you will. But, but you know, this is replication. And you know, we got questions about other demands. You know, other demands, what would be the return profiles and all that sort of stuff. Which, People don't ask when you're asking for $25 million to build your next Twitter. It's not, you know, maybe if you, what we should be looking at is a venture capital model or some other models that would enable us to replicate more and we can scale it up. We can create 2 million hectares worth of conservation that could be worth $20 billion or at least for the next 30 years it'll be conserved. Now, that's something that you know, we as a business grapple with and hopefully, you know, that there's more light towards the solution as we then, you know, work on time. Thank you. Sheila, uh, Thank you to you, Nathan, to you and Argan um, for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm going to just try to speak as quickly as possible about some research that we're doing which links, I would say, the role of the private sector and the public sector in the context of green growth. Um, I particularly work on questions of private finance or private investment, um, initially focused on the issue of climate change, but I think what you'll notice, maybe, in discussions about the sustainable development goals or discussions about green growth or discussions about red is this idea about mobilizing private investment. I think we hear it quite a lot. Um, and I think oftentimes when we hear about mobilizing private investment, there's a focus on innovative instruments or de-risking um, investments, which is important, but I think also it's important to look, I guess, beyond the role of private sector or private finance and investors alone, and also look at the role of governments in shaping investment. Um, so basically, one of the things I think that I've, that I've become aware of through my research is that government actually has a lot of tools that it can use to mobilize the private sector and to mobilize private finance. We've divided these tools for our research categories, which are regulatory instruments, economic instruments, and information instruments. And economic instruments will include things um, like bonds in terms, of, in terms of provision of debt or equity, but it, it looks more broadly at the range of incentives that governments can provide. Some people um, call these tools of industrial policy. This kind of concept of industrial policy is sort of gaining ground again and became very unsexy, and as I think getting a bit sexier again. Um, but the, the tools are very, are very um, sort of broad and I think well established in a number of sectors. And so the question is, how do you use these tools um, in new green sectors in the way that they're already used across the economy? And that's some of the, some of the work that we're doing. I worked in the carbon markets for about six years. And I think you can see how when there is a, a regulatory signal, where there's a, a cap um, on, on emissions, you can see how private money moves really quickly. It didn't move into the forestry as, at speed, but it definitely moved into um, energy, energy projects. Um, industrial projects, and, uh, and so I think we can see how private money can be moved. It's just a question of how often governments, either together or um, at a national level, can use these tools. And um, I guess part of our research um, has started off with looking at uh, fossil fuel subsidies because I think they're one of the sort of best documented examples of where governments are using significant resources to direct private investment in one direction. Um, and we've done some work to compare um, fossil fuel subsidies with climate finance, which is some of the money that was agreed in Copenhagen towards addressing the climate change issue. If you look at a comparison between fossil fuel subsidies um, globally and what's um, going into climate finance, it's quite stark. So depending on who you listen to, because there's lots of different fossil fuel subsidy estimates, but if you look at what the IEA is estimating, they're saying it's around 600 billion a year in fossil fuel subsidies. You have estimates actually from the IMF that are higher than that because they look at uh, mispricing of carbon, and so they're talking about one to two trillion a year. 
And you compare that with climate finance, which we know is meant to go up to 100 million a year, but right now it's at about 10 million a year. Um, so what we need to think about, I think, is no, you know, really recognizing that we use these tools, our governments use these tools, and these, this shapes our economy and it also shapes private investment. So how can we use these tools differently? So we started to do some research, um, not on the kind of question of energy and on fossil fuel subsidies, but specifically looking at this question in the context of red. And we wanted to get to see if we could do a similar analysis. Can you compare climate finance or finance for red with subsidies that may be driving deforestation? Uh, we know that climate finance or finance for red right now is at about one billion a year. So we wanted to see, well, what can we say about these other incentives um, that might be working against the finance for red? And so our, our research is based around an analysis looking at four key commodities driving deforestation in, in two countries. So we're looking at Brazil and Indonesia, um, and we're looking at palm and timber in Indonesia, and soy and cattle in Brazil. Um, the research is about halfway done, so if anyone's interested or has any inputs, we would like to be to have speak with you after this. Um, but what we've done so far is nest-based research, trying to look at industrial policy tools or incentives and subsidies in these um, key commodities in these countries. And um, I guess what I would start off by saying is that there are no international data sets on this. So we're very fortunate when you want to look for fossil fuel subsidy numbers. Now the IMF just put out a report this year. The IEA has done that for the past three years. When you look at agricultural commodities, we don't have the same international comparable data sets. I wouldn't say that fossil fuel subsidy data sets are perfect, but we don't have that for, um, for these commodities. I should say agriculture and timber. Um, so what we want to do really at this stage, and I think it's sort of important to think about is more about just trying to identify these incentives and which ones um, are working for or against red objectives. The, and the ODA, versus development systems, all of this could be used to support, um, you know, to create positive incentives or to support reform of these, um, of these incentives. So what have we found so far? As I said, it's very you know, early days still in our research, but um, we identified 56 um, subsidies or incentives um, linked to these key commodities. We can only find a quantification for six of the 56. <laughs> so if you want that number for what we can compare to the 10 billion, it's quite difficult because we don't we don't have a lot of, of um, quantification that's happening currently. Some of the interesting findings are that actually a lot of these um, subsidies or incentives are actually not directed towards that specific commodity. So if you take palm oil, for instance, you'll actually have a lot of subsidies or incentives that are actually directed more generally to agriculture, significant subsidies that are directed towards biofuels, some subsidies that are directed towards plantations. So the question is, you know, what are the outcomes that are, are, are we wanting from these incentives and subsidies? And perhaps if we tailor them or if they're made more exact, we can get the outcomes you want, maybe for rural development, economic growth, um, the social protection, um, you can get those things alongside um, avoiding deforestation. Um, the other is that most of the subsidies come from federal governments, but some also come from foreign governments. So we found subsidies in, um, in Brazil and in Indonesia that are coming from the Indian government, that are coming from the Chinese government, that are coming from the EU. So subsidies in those countries that have a big impact on um, these commodities. We haven't looked at development finance or export credit. I'm sure if we looked at those, they'd be much more significant. And we will as um, part of this work. Uh, I think the other, I, um, yeah, sorry, those are probably about the, the most important at this point. I don't want to um, and I think another thing that's interesting is to see how uh, some different, uh, different researchers are also looking at opportunities for reform or new ways of using fiscal policy. So this week a study came out from the National Academy of Sciences, which was looking at cattle um, in Brazil. And what they found was that um, they are saying that you could reduce global deforestation emissions by 26% through cattle intensification. And they're proposing specific taxes um, for cattle raised on low intensity pasture, and then specific subsidies for cattle that are produced on semi-intensive pastures. So how you can use taxes and subsidies in a way that's relatively neutral to actually um, encourage cattle intensification and reduce deforestation. So I guess I mean, that was all that I wanted to, to talk about, was to, was to raise the, the fact that um, my understanding is that in, um, the UN Red has done a number of country assessments, and that in 60% of these assessments, um, what was found is that there was a very urgent need to look at existing laws, policies, and practices that provide incentives that cause deforestation. And so I think there is a recognition of this issue um, within the red community, and I think it's more that it needs to be raised on the agenda, and that also resources need to be put to bear so that we have a better understanding of these incentives and, um, and what their impacts are. Finally, fun.
easily. It was about 1.5. People look at that from a business perspective and think, this is going to allow my cost of capital range to be fantastic. We all should get into this. Obviously, the market price is risk. All I'm talking about is the definition of a bond of being a green bond. And some intermediaries say that is a green bond. What that project is or what it does is a matter of complete differentiation. I mean, Unilever has got all sorts of benchmarks that people need to meet to qualify for the sort of money they've just raised. But I think that once you have green bonds taken up by sovereign wealth funds around the world, taken up in a major way by the sorts of investments that the Australian superannuation will need, um, and when the pool of savings in the world has a designated portion of it in green bonds, it will one, drive the sorts of economies that we're talking about here, but it will also change, and I think this is the most important point I want to make, uh, from a financial, from a banking perspective, it will change the perception of what green investment is. Right? That's the most important thing of the lot, because the world really doesn't quite understand uh, about what the green economy is. And uh, everybody in, in, in the world that I come from, and I've been doing this job for over 40 years, which is depressing, but, 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 but the world that I come from equates green with risk. And you need to de-risk the word green. And if you've got sovereign wealth funds that have a responsibility of saving for, those, for the future of those people, and as part of what they do, one, it will happen, but two, it will be the initiator and driver of a whole lot of other actions by other investors taking up these bonds. And, and we, we should look forward to an environment <coughs> in this time where there are two or three trillion dollars worth of green bonds of all various denominations for all different sorts of things with all different percents of interest according to risk. Okay, thanks Paul. Next, um, maybe following on from, uh, from Mark's answer, how much of an issue in your work is the lack of large-scale long-term demand for, uh, for um, the financing that you need to expand your, your work? And how would, uh, how would your work and your approach change if this kind of demand is realized? Yeah, I think, I think that's one of the critical uh, questions that we face whenever we talk to uh, someone from, from, from the financial world. I mean, is there demand? Now, and I think, I think that falls upon all of us to, you know, if we want to see this model uh, succeed, we need to be able to somehow create demand. And I've been talking to Pahedo, for example, here, and also to anybody who wants to listen in Indonesia. For example, if we have the Norway fund who's supposed to be talking about payment for results, some of those funds to be able to say, okay, we're going to allocate X amount of dollars to guarantee purchase of carbon credit offset products, I think that would do great in terms of our ability then to raise finance. On a smaller scale, we've also already done that in our first project, in which you know, we got contracts from some of the largest European companies who would say, once you produce, we're willing to buy X million tons, small amount, at X dollars, and then we can take that to a bank and say, hey, you know, here's already an offtake agreement, now we have the risk of regulation and the risk of production. And they are usually, on the risk of production, it would be more or less the same as risk of production of co-op or CTO, they will be comfortable. And on the risk of regulation, you know, financial industries, for example, have already invested quite a bit in Indonesia, would also already understand that. So in, in short, yes, that's one thing that we really need at the moment, and having that would make uh, this kind of project sail a lot easier. Sheila, I can to you next. Um, in your research, have you come across any good examples of where uh, incentives have been restructured to produce a sort of double dividend where um, it's disincentivizing damaging behavior and incentivizing positive behavior? I think, um, I mean, it, most of my research so far has been in the question of fossil fuel subsidies. I think there is, um, there is definitely work that's been done on um, on reform and processes for reform, and I think when um, we started this work looking at subsidies um, to key commodities, I think the reform processes will likely be 
similar, the barriers and the challenges that are faced are fairly similar. Um, often, there's been other sort of context discussions about data and access to information. I think a lot of this work is about sort of modeling and understanding the impact of these incentives, then being able to communicate those and being able to have transparency around those, and then also um, you know, communicating about how the reform process would work. In the um, fossil fuel subsidy space, there is a very strong and obvious price impact. And um, I think there's increasingly investors in, let's say, renewable areas who are saying, you know, there was a renewable um, energy company in India who's saying, you know, what we need is for coal subsidies to be removed because that has a significant impact on price, which means people will invest in that as opposed to renewable production. And now is saying, okay, we still want access to that resource, but we only want it if it's coming from certain types of sources. Um, so there are some examples that we're seeing and we'll show in our research that are historic subsidies that have been performed or whether the process is now to undertake reform. Um, Pavan. Uh, I know that you have uh, recently um, written a book uh, called Corporation 2020 that presents new approaches to measuring the real cost of business and corporations' obligation to society. Can you uh, explain a bit maybe some of the approaches that you lay out in your book and how they could be used to lay the groundwork for um, a private sector that is engaged in low carbon, resource efficient, and socially inclusive profit making? Sure. Um, Corporation 2020 is about the business model for the future. Uh, the essential point big thing is that today, two thirds of the economy and jobs are essentially private sector. And if you want a different economic direction, a different kind of resource use, then you need a different kind of engine to drive that for the economy. And that engine is corporation right? Some of the uh, DNA of tomorrow's corporation is already here. But it's nicely mixed in with the DNA of yesterday's corporation, which is still the dominant DNA. And what you need is change. And like any species, the corporation will change in response to its environment, which means, in the case of the corporation, policies, prices, and institutions. And one of the institutions that need to change is the way we tax. <laughs> Today, our whole taxation thinking is basically about tax the goods, don't tax the banks. So hard work, in other words, income tax, we tax that. Uh, uh, private sector ingenuity and, and, and uh, entrepreneurship, generating corporate profit, we tax that, corporation tax. But when it comes to resource use, especially if it's scarce resources, or resource use as in the atmospheric resource, which is causing a problem, a huge potential future problem for humanity in terms of climate change. We don't tax that. So this whole idea of what are we taxing versus what are we not taxing is completely, if I may say, pass of our face. So we need the French. So the second reason why it's a good thing for governments to think about is that today, those, those governments are the D20 who actually think that they can plan the next 10 years and meet their fiscal gaps by raising more corporation tax at a time when we still aren't out of the recession and companies are making less profits at lower margins. And those who don't think that they can raise income tax because despite the recession and its impacts on the fact that people have lost jobs and unemployment is high and new jobs are pricing in lower than old jobs. And seriously, they need to have their thoughts, their thinking apparatus examined. Uh, so I think the idea that governments can still use the old model of taxation to move forward the next 10 years is seriously flawed. They need to think about resource taxation as not a good environmental initiative, but as the only survival mechanism they have for balancing their budgets. So that's why I think this will happen. I think that's where green economy and red plus come straight in. Because here we are presenting an alternative way of asking corporations to be involved, where they are contributing towards the economy, they are investing in, in this new model, and hopefully, government will be able to give them some offsets, tax offsets. In other words, if you purchase Red Plus credits, if you invest in these, here's some relief on the investment side, here's some relief on the corporation tax side. These are the initiatives and, and, and mechanisms that we need to dialogue with governments. So, what happened is that that plan got burned and burned and burned again every year. Even when they plan for any rubber. The reason is they plant rubber and they leave it to grow, not tending the plantation itself. Okay, because I have planted it. And then we came 
after research done by the Ministry of Agriculture. So we provide them the plantation of the rubber together with pineapple. The pineapple generate income quicker than the rubber itself. And then we improve the fertilizer and we improve the water management. 100 hectares of that. And what happened was that the people get much more income, much more happiness, and much more socializing between them because they get to that and no fire. So that is actually getting what we want in a very good way together with the people. If you have just done it for research, then it's just getting you of the benefit. But in fulfilling the community, you are actually getting the economy moving. I think that is really important in a way, right? Now, when we try to measure the income of these people, I'm talking about GDP for the poor, because not only we calculate GDP on the macro side, okay? But when you're talking about GDP on the poor, it happens that those communities have a take equivalent of three and a half million rupiah of income every month. But 75% of that, 76% of that, is income in the form of in kind, not in cash. Yes, exactly. And this in kind is actually gotten, gotten from the forest, gotten from the river, gotten from this. So when I go to a community and say that, all right, you have three and a half million now in this kind of composition, I'll get that to you in 10 years. Is these people getting more? Is these people getting 7, 7 million, 10 million? Where is the partnership that you are offering for these people in terms of getting them the benefit by being in considering them not as a laborer, but as a partner? Because that is the essence of this green economy. Now, when I say that and trying to answer your question, how do I connect that? How do, how do I, can, can you repeat the question? <laughs> uh, you've spoken before about how the private sector can be the driver for the oh, plus. Of course, that's why I mentioned about ECA. <laughs> <laughs> now, if ECA, the ecosystem restoration, is having the mindset to actually doing that improvement of the protection of the forest, as well as the improvement of the economy of the poor that is living there into a level that is faster than the growth of the economy of the nation, that is where they become a driver that's progress. of Red Plus. And Red Plus, in my definition, being using green economy as the backbone. And a little bit on those questions of ECA, if we have been using the money from Norway, I went to Norway, I talked to the parliament, I talked to the people there, and they say, this is the money, the public money from the people of Norway for the people of Indonesia. The government of Norway and the government of Indonesia is just a middleman. But it's people to people. No offset please. And this is coming from the people that manage, that provide the public funds. So when they talk about public fund, and it's getting through this, not the private investment that is separate, the public fund, the management of this fund by the government that is receiving this fund for the purpose of development of that trust, even that is payment for itself, is actually for development. Now this is something that we may use to analyze how can we then restructure our taxation so that again the government being the regulator creates that environment, create the regulations that is actually directed toward green economy and doing that, that must be the Thank you. For another set of questions then, um, then I'll revert back to uh, additional questions. Um, please also note if your question is for a specific panelist or um, it's just a general question for the panelists. Okay, I see one here. All right, I'm to get since you know. This is a question for Mike Carlos. Um, considering the extensive knowledge you have of the banking and private sector, what would be the broad advice uh, to give to environmental policy makers in terms of key policy signals uh, to unlock financing investment scale? Yes, Mike. Uh, thank you for your question. Was what, what policy initiatives would you like to use? Exactly. To, to, well, I think it's pretty simple. Um, the most important thing is transparency. 
Um, I think that the, 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 the investing in, in green requires a length, it requires certainty, it requires legal certainty. It's, it's, the, uh, the point I'm trying to make today is that, that, is that there is no difference in investing in the green sector, in financing the green sector, to financing anything else. Um, it, it, the problem is the green sector has been perceived as somehow being a risk sector. Um, and and, and that, that's actually wrong um, for the oil sector, by tax incentives or whatever. Um, providing you've got transparency, providing you've got certainty, um, when you look to uh, advising the green sector on what they should do, they should be, it, it, it should be transparent, it should be, it should be certain. Um, uh, and the, the point that I was making earlier in terms of, of the bond it is, is not for people to choose winners, but to, for people to designate what is green and what is not. Um, and and I, I really, you know, I, I sit here and I'm arrogant enough to say to you that I'm certain that, that, that you know, if this conversation were held in five or six years' time, you'd be talking about a green bond market of, of several trillion dollars and you'd be talking about a renewed interest in green investments because a whole series of, of countries will relook at how they actually allocate their resources in terms of tax revenue and I think incentives will change. I'm, I'm an optimist. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right, uh, Tomo Kaurne from Arbrat. We are a forest measurement company and uh, we're heavily involved in this Nepalese uh, reference level calculation that was endorsed by the World Bank, just like with DRC. And my question is directed to Mark and Kat Pavan, both of you. I guess in, in normal bond markets, you're sort of uh, dare to make the investment because there is some perception of a buyer of last resort, let's say the subprime, subprime uh, crisis, eventually the central banks uh, ended up buying, likewise in Euro crisis. So who or what entity would you envisage to play that role in, in case we ended up having a green uh, bond bubble at some point? Well, I, I don't think that, um, I, I don't think there's going to be a green bubble. Um, uh, um, if you abide by the very rule that I just put out earlier, um, if you look at, at what happened in, in, in the Lehman crisis, uh, there is one fundamental problem. There was a lack of, there was a lack of, of, of any understanding of what in fact were these bonds. Uh, so if you go through my premise of, of the ability to see through the sunlight test, so you can actually see what the asset is, I don't see there going to be a bubble in green bonds. I think it's a, a, a misnomer. And certainly I don't, I don't see any concept of a government underwriting green bonds. That is, that is a, another fallacy. Um, green bonds stand on their own. They do not need a government guarantee. Using too much leverage or, or just you know, abusing leverage. And this lack of control of leverage has been at the heart of each one of the last four financial crises. I'm going all the way back to the Latin American debt crisis, you know, savings and loans crisis, um, the, the Asian debt crisis, and the most recent one. So the question is, what is it that makes us not control leverage? Is this blind belief somehow that markets will do that for us? And somehow that you know, your, your twos and twenties fund manager sitting out there is, is the conscience keeper of the world? I find it difficult to believe. There's nothing wrong with controlling leverage. There's nothing wrong with stating the purpose of the loan. There was a time many years ago when stating the purpose of the loan was essentially what would be something the consortium of bankers for a company would agree was worthwhile, appropriate, or not appropriate. And if it was appropriate and worthwhile, they would compete amongst each other to lend it to that company. But the purpose and the quantum were understood. A green bond will have a stated purpose. It is to green the economy, defined appropriately and measured by someone independent. So I think this is actually an improvement on the kind of credit discipline that we have today, Mark, where we don't question purpose. And I think, therefore, even less reason to look for uh, lenders of last resort or final fallout catch, you know, catch all sugar daddy, uh, which usually is a central bank, which is usually then supported by the government, which is usually paid for by you, the taxpayer. So the real answer to the question, who's the sugar daddy? It's you, sunshine. <laughs>
Transparency equals credit worthiness. Transparency equals credit worthiness. I'd like to do a little bit of a devil's advocate here, suggesting that what's wrong with the green bubble? If you look at <laughs> everybody else has had one, you mean? Yeah. If, if you look at if you look at the e-commerce, I'm, 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 I'm a computer scientist by training, so I'm also very displaced here. Now, uh, if, I, if, if you look at the the e-commerce, the internet bubble, circa a certain uh, bubble number one, ninety-five to two thousand, you know, where everybody riding in the back of a, of, a, of a napkin can get three to five billion dollars of. Uh, funding from uh, uh, venture capital, some of those funding actually materialized. Some of those crazy projections by eBay, Amazon, and Yahoo actually get realized, while some of the pets.com went you know, into the dustbin of history. Now, if we try to do that for green economy, for environmental services, who knows? We might end up having a Google, Yahoo, eBay solution. We just haven't seen it. <laughs> we want equality. If everyone else can have a bubble, why not we? <laughs> Even that national focal point in Bangladesh, I have some uh, questions and observations. Actually, the red victims are the local people. So, say they want to get something from the red management. If we invest money from the bank, so uh, they need to repay the loan. Is it possible to the private sector bank to invest uh, without, uh, without interest, that is for their social responsibility? One question. And uh, Sila, I, she suggested that uh, in red mechanism, Government should invest money. Actually, the government is very much burdened with several activities, and uh, uh, so how can we uh, impose the government to invest money in the red mechanism? And uh, Mr. Babal Sukde, he said about the tax, those private company. Uh, invest money in the uh, red sector, uh, maybe uh, government impose more taxes. So my suggestion is that, is there any possible to tax free those who uh, uh, invest money in the red sector? And another to Prasitu, that is, okay, we invest or we, we are working for the red, but for the inter, uh, uh, interest of the people, incentives of the people, we have to sell the carbon to the market. Is it possible to sell the uh, red, uh, red carbon to the market? Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. I'll give a short answer and then others can. Uh, in answer to your question, yes, it is actually possible to change taxation structure. Today's taxation for a corporation is corporation tax. But if you think back to the European Union ETS, the emissions trading scheme, they were actually paying more tax than just their corporation tax because they were having to buy carbon credits to offset their emissions so long as they were higher than the cap and so on. So it was a kind of tax. In the same way, if we could ask companies to purchase green carbon credits, in other words, red plus credits, they would do so if that was the rule. And then you could say, if you purchase green carbon credits or red plus credits, then your corporation tax liability goes down by X. We could also give them investment allowance. If they invest in these, as not directly involved in them, but just as pure financial investments in red plus credits, then they can get investment allowances. So there are ways in which we can structure these assets and these, these investments in red plus into the tax system by creating tax offsets. So that was one. And the other is, Yes, you can have green carbon markets. I mean, we've had a, uh, a sort of market, the EU ETS, the EU Emissions Trading Scheme, was a marketplace for 2,500 odd companies who were involved in buying and selling amongst each other. Sadly, there was no linking directive between our world of green carbon and their world of, of carbon credits. So the link never happened. 
and therefore forestry credits could never be sold into the EU ETS. But of course, that's just history. Let's not be guided by history. We can move forward. We can think of ways of doing that. So it is possible. Did you have a question for Pat Kiru? Sorry, we're having a little bit of trouble with the sound. Was that, was that an answer to all of your questions? Asadu, actually, he said that uh, he is uh, saying about the green economy, uh, that is the uh, forest uh, national investment. But my question, my, uh, question is that it is very difficult to sell the car. You see, about uh, three years we, from Bangladesh, we uh, try to sell carbon. But it is uh, very difficult. We are not selling the carbon, Sundarban carbon, the biggest mangrove forest in the world. Uh, and also, uh, uh, in, in a wildlife sanctuary, we measure the carbon and we uh, uh, try to sell in the voluntary market. But it is difficult. So, my question is that we, we, we are doing everything in case of rent, but how we can sell the uh, carbon in the market? So, to continue my, my answer in, in the case of Bangladesh, if you were to introduce in your corporation tax system an element that you know, a further amount of investment in red plus credits is required by companies based on how much profits they make, they must invest X percent in them. It's like a tax and then give them relief on the corporation tax. You will suddenly find that you have created demand for this instrument called red plus credit. Now, the challenge to me is on the origination side. How will you structure that instrument in a sound way so that it is what it says it is and that somebody is checking it and somebody is verifying it and that the instrument actually represents some real value added for Bangladesh, Sundarbans forest or forest generally or for carbon storage in the world. To me this is, I think intellectually in terms of the complexity, I think structuring the tax side is less difficult. Structuring the origination of the instrument needs a bit more effort. Actually, my question is that how we will sell the car, not tax. <laughs> this is my question to uh, our excellency. Yeah. Did you want to come Sorry, I thought you also had a question, but maybe I missed it. You had a question about how governments can impose on, um, basically how can governments impose investment in red, That's what I had understood. I think this sort of um, um, builds um, what Prabhupada was saying is, I think what you see now is that governments already have tools that they're using. So if you talk about subsidies, there's two sides of that. There's budget expenditure. So governments are already spending their own budgets on all sorts of things, yeah. including fossil fuel subsidies, but other subsidies. Also, governments provide tax breaks. So they are not collecting tax revenue from certain things like you were saying in terms of resources. Buying computers, you get a tax break. You can, you can shift these. So the money doesn't have to appear out of thin air. The, the money is there. It's a question of where you collect it and where you spend it. And it's changing those. And to be honest, having worked in the carbon market for six years, I don't think this is, to me, this is an overly complex mechanism if you can use the tax base and your expenditures, which is something that all governments are doing, and is a much more straightforward and direct signal, which requires less intermediation, even though I know that it was, a, you know, there were a lot of people who benefited from that in the carbon markets. There are simpler mechanisms to move um, private money around. We have a couple more minutes left, so we can maybe take one or two more questions. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is uh, uh, Mahmood. I am the Red National Focal Point for Pakistan. Uh, I am just repeating a question which was uh, asked by me in the another session downstairs after lunch and I was advised to put it to this forum because we didn't get the uh, answer. And uh, the very, it's very simple. I am rephrasing it. Uh, now taking, looking at the history of the private investment investors coming to the red markets, uh, there was an episode of uh, what we call red cowboys. Uh, but uh, uh, had there been some checks and balances, uh, we, some people think that uh, the red plus market would have boosted a lot. And uh, uh, now, uh, are there any safeguards or any country has developed, especially Indonesia, some procedures and uh, standards for private sector investors uh, to uh, come in the red markets, uh, get uh, hold of the uh, 
uh, credits, sell them wherever they want and there should be no problem like Bangladesh is facing, it's their responsibility to sell it where, at whatever rate. Uh, so is there any system of checks and balances because what you say will be helpful for me uh, back home in Pakistan. Like to respond to that? Okay. I'll try. This is a very difficult question. Sure, sir. Uh, safeguards as well as uh, how to protect the community and uh, people in large, at large from the act of the carbon cowboys, so to speak. Actually, the carbon cowboys plays a very important role in terms of creating this notion that there is a benefit protecting the forest. Okay, there is one. But of course, it has to be checked. <coughs> it is now the responsibility of the government. My responsibility and it is very difficult to convince the people that it's actually not only about carbon. Not only about carbon. This is about development. It is something that you can gain benefit from these activities. But that is action after. And so I go to the forest in Kalimantan or Sumatra or Papua. They always say, I have protected my forest. Where is the money? Right? I have protected my forest, where is the money? And that was because in the beginning the campaign was for the economic benefit. And that economic benefit is a short term. You protect the money, you protect the forest, let the tree standing and money will come. It's not that easy. Okay? It's not that easy. And because of that, the safeguard that we are applying for protecting the people from the act of those uh, uh, unscrupulous, what do you call it, cowboys, <laughs> was actually applying this is how you deal with this business here. I mean, our safeguard in Indonesia is called Preside, which is basically not only social safeguard, not only economic safeguard, but also environmental safeguard at the same time, and treating the community, community and the people as partners instead of disturbed neighbor. Too many activities whereby you get into a location and as you are going to be disturbed, then this is a compensation for the disturbers. <coughs> Not anymore. We have to deal with that on a conceptual basis with everybody as a partner. But the notion that this is quick money, protect the forest, we get the money, will still be there for a long time. So we need to position that into the development especially when we deal with the public fund for that. But private funds, private money, then you have taxation as a game plan that you can play with. Thank you. We are unfortunately out of time, um, so I, uh, I would like to thank our panelists again for your um, fascinating interventions and uh, sharing the work and um, experiences that you have with us today. This is a vast and evolving topic, and uh, I'd like to also thank UNEP for having made this first attempt to begin to address it in, uh, in their report, uh, which I mentioned before is in the back of the room. I ask you to pick up a copy on the way out or download it from the website. Uh, they will be following up in the coming months with additional work on this topic, so stay tuned for, uh, for future work on this. Thanks again to all of you and to uh, UNEP and to the UN Red Program for hosting this event, and uh, thanks for your attendance and participation.